Zach Bowen and Addie Hall both lived in the French Quarter of New Orleans, where this story truly starts. The French Quarter is well known for its historic nature. Markets, boutiques, and plenty of modern businesses and restaurants have moved in, making it a place many people feel at home. This is where they met, both bartenders, free spirits, drawn to both the French Quarter and each other. They hit it off quickly, but their relationship was really solidified during Hurricane Katrina. Addie wouldn't evacuate for the hurricane, so Zach stayed behind with her and quite literally weathered the storm. The French Quarter wasn't affected too badly aside from power outages and downed limbs, but this really was the beginning of Zach and Addie's story, and we are far from the end. I do feel sorry for him. Power outages suck. Yeah, we recently had some storms down here in, uh, you know, Tornado Alley. And um, power outages aren't fun to deal with. Three days without power. Yeah, I don't want to rub this in your face, but I had power. I was fine. <laughs> yeah, but it kind of works out since Wednesday you had to stay like an hour late. Because of a tornado warning, <laughs> just sitting at work, waiting to die. Oh, it's fine. We lived. That's the difference between me and Jordan. Jordan stays at work for an hour to avoid the tornado. I leave in the middle of a tornado to get home. He really did, though. He was like, nah, I'm done. We're done. <laughs> I was like, I think I'm just going to stay here where it's safe. At four o'clock, I'm out that door whether there's a tornado or not. I feel like that's kind of like the difference between these two people, too. It was like, one of them was like, I'm going to go to safety. And the other was like, this is safe. I'm staying right here. And as an introvert, I feel that because I'd probably stay home too. That's fair. I get it. Because like at the same time, when you evacuate, especially I'm sure New Orleans is expensive to live in. Any big city is expensive to live in. But like, I can't imagine the French Quarter is cheap by any means. No. Even no. if you're not living in a nice place. Yeah. And of course, I'm pretty sure the real estate skyrocketed. Like it always does after a natural disaster. Oh, always. But when you evacuate, if you don't have somewhere to go, what are you supposed to do? If you don't have any money, especially. I've always wondered that. Because you hear about that all the time with people evacuating hurricanes and stuff. If you have family outside, that's perfectly fine. But if you don't, what are you supposed to do? Exactly. Like, you're just stuck. If I had to evacuate because of a hurricane, here, I'd be living in my car at that point. Uh, yeah, I would be. Because I have, like, I don't know, $40 in my pocket. You're rich. That's like $39.80 more than what I have, so. Congratulations. When the hurricane ended and power came back on and life went back to normal, their relationship started to waver. Addie was bipolar and had a tendency to forget her medication, so she'd have frequent angry outbursts and they'd start having fights. Often, Zach wasn't just a bystander either. He suffered from PTSD from being in the war, and he had a couple of kids as well from a previous relationship that had been taken from his ex-wife. Addie was not a fan of the kids, and the arguments just got worse from there. So, what do you do when your relationship is falling apart? Get a new apartment together and try to start new. So Zach and Addie got a new apartment right above a voodoo temple. Now typically, voodoo isn't dark, but this place is supposedly very haunted and has a dark energy. It was only days since they moved in when trouble hit. Addie found out Zach had been cheating and asked the landlord to put the new apartment in her name only. And that is when Zach seemed to snap. So, I deal with bipolar. I get that part. The only red flag really for me so far is the fact that she didn't like his kids. If you're going to date someone who has kids, you have to like their kids. Package deal type thing. But obviously, I know where the story's going. Yeah, the way I understood it, he didn't have very much custody of the kids. Almost none, for the most part. His ex-wife just stole them away, which is not a nice thing to do, in my opinion. But I don't know the entire story there, so I'm also not going to judge. Because if we are to... Let me put this a different way. Once you hear the rest of the story, maybe it might have been a good thing that she did. Because he might not exactly be the most stable, good person for the kids to be around. Just saying. Yeah, and I'm trying to, like, make an opinion based on the information you gave me, gave me. Not necessarily the information that I know. Because unlike most stories that Jordan tells me, this one I actually do know about. But I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt, at least for now. But obviously, their relationship was toxic. Very toxic, in my opinion. 
But to be fair, they had to go from the dating phase to the surviving a natural disaster phase pretty quickly. Yeah, but weirdly enough, the surviving phase was what they were really good at. And so I think going back to the normal was what set everything metaphorically up in flames. Like the going back to normal is really what started the downfall. But that's hard for everybody because heck, we've experienced it with the pandemic. That's very true. And even before that, the Joplin tornado, because especially after a natural disaster, you go through that phase where it's the surviving, not having to go and not having a job, not having to deal with all that stuff. Just not worrying about money, basically, just surviving in the moment. Exactly. You're just living in the moment. You're with each other. And that's really all that's matter. You know, all that matters at that point is just you two. And I know that they were helping with their neighbors while helping them survive. And they had a big bonfire that they would cook at. From what I read, it was basically the whole neighborhood like came together and was helping each other survive and taking care of each other. Yeah, exactly. It was a whole big thing. Mm -hmm. Let's be real. Most relationships fail because of money. That's the most stressful part of life in general. You add a new relationship into that, and then it's very easy for that stuff to tear you apart. I guess I'm speaking from experience. I am too, honestly, because how one person deals with money and bills isn't the same as how another person deals with money and bills. And just even the way that you were raised can affect a relationship really deeply from money issues. And from what I can tell, these two were pretty dang different in that department. Yeah, and bipolar, one of, one of the, let's say, negative symptoms of bipolar is the tendency to impulse by. Yeah, you get dopamine from it. Yeah. Honestly, way back in the day, I was really bad about that. I'm better now. I'm still really bad about it. <laughs> You've seen the money I spent on this podcast, so I'm not perfect at it. Do you know how many new lip rings that I have? Because I got my lip pierced, and then I immediately bought, like, at least seven. Because I could. And I couldn't even change this thing for two months. Okay. But I was like, ooh, gotta buy these now. I got really excited. And so I bought a whole bunch. But I get it, though. Because, like, you just go and you spend money for the dopamine rush, and... That doesn't bode well for your relationship because then it's like, why did you spend this money? We needed it for, I don't know, electric bill, water bill, repairs. And honestly, she probably had that too when I, he was probably the opposite. Just because in my experience, opposites seem to attract on that part. You're not wrong. Because somehow it's always one person who just spends everything they have all the time and is, I don't know how I'm going to get to next week. And then somehow they do. And then there's the other person who's watching every cent in their account. The financially responsible one and the impulsive buy-in maniac person. Hey, that one's me. That was me too, so. <laughs> you ever want to know how the podcast is going? Not going to lie, that's how we got these new microphones. These were a great buy. Oh, they really were. They haven't died yet. I'm still waiting for our sponsorship deal with Rode. These are awesome. They're Jordan proof. They really are, though. I started designing Jordan Proof stickers. Excellent. We're going to start selling them. You can only use them if whatever you are using is actually Jordan Proof, though. Spoiler alert, there's not much out there. <laughs> there is not. So far, it is these microphones. And your computer work, but that's only temporary because you break that every week. Yeah, the IT department just sees me come over and they're like, oh, God. They have Jordan's picture in the server room. This one breaks everything. Yeah, I know. It's been through like four hard drives at this point. I don't even know what I do. It just starts not working. That's the truth. Ugh. It's exist. That's all I do is exist and then it stops working. That's enough for the electronics apparently. It is. That's enough. Around 1 a.m. on October 5th, 2006, Zach strangled Addie to death, presumably after a fight. He fell asleep, drunk, next to her. Then the next day, this is really disgusting, I'm sorry, had sex with her corpse, and then went about his day going to work as usual. Zach then went back to the apartment, cut Addie's body up in the bathtub, and put her various body parts on the stove, in the refrigerator, and in the oven, and then tried to cook her flesh off of her bones so that she would be easier to dispose of. If anyone asked where Addie was, he told them that she left the state. 
because of Addie's tendency towards unpredictable behavior, people pretty much believed her. Right up until October 17th. So yeah, this, this dude was a little weird, to say the least. I just, I don't know. I like to try to understand like what they were thinking. I just can't understand any of what he did. The only part of this that I understand, and the only part is it will be easier to dispose of her in small pieces. And that's the only part that I can understand. I get that, but then he didn't try to actually dispose of any of her, though. That's a weird part. I know. I don't understand that part of it either. I just, that's the only part of it that I do understand. And obviously he was having some sort of mental complete breakdown or something. And I'll, we'll get into this more later because I'll let you finish it before. But I got a theory. Because this is one of those cases that seems almost too perfect. Like too open and shut. It's a weird one. But it is a weird one. And that's what makes it weird is the fact that it ties itself up in a nice box with the bow and everything at the end. Everything's just, there it goes, nice and closed and pretty. And it's like, but is it? I think there's definitely more to this story than what is believed to be the truth. Just because very, very, can't talk. Very rarely is a story this open and shut, this like perfect. Like black and white and clear cut. Yeah. But we'll get into that later. But yeah, this dude is, if he did all this, creepy dude. Yeah, he was messed up. And I get, I get the cutting the body up and all that stuff. The having sex with a corpse thing is not something that I can wrap my head around. No, 1,000 million percent no. All of the no. We'll let you finish for now and we'll, I'll come back to my theory because again, too perfect. I gotta agree. And that's something that won't happen very often. On October 17th, Zach finally seemed to realize the extent of his actions. Coworkers said he'd been acting odd, and that night, Zach took his own life by jumping off the seventh floor of a hotel, leaving a note in his back pocket for police only, along with his dog tags and keys to Addie's apartment. The letter read, This is not accidental. I had to take my own life to pay for the one I took. If you send a patrol car to 826 North Ramp, you will find the dismembered corpse of my girlfriend Addie in the oven, on the stove, and in the fridge and a full signed confession from myself, Zach Bowen. Not only did the police find Addie's remains exactly as he said, but they also found Addie's diary, which Zach had added to after her murder, saying after he murdered her, he decided to, and I quote, spend the $1,500 cash I had being happy until I killed myself. So that's what I did. Good food, good drugs, good strippers, good friends, and any loose ends I may have had. So this is the part that what I was saying is it's too perfect. He leaves a note on his body that says, go here, you'll find the body and a full confession for me. Why would you need two different confessions? Would love to know, aside from the fact that he's just a screwed up individual. I have no idea. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me either. Now, I didn't put the entire letter in there, everything that he wrote in the diary, just because some of it was just ranting, some of it was illegible. That was just a short little excerpt from it. But dude was, I don't know, it doesn't it, fit right. To me, the part that makes the most sense is someone else killed her, dismembered her, basically to frame him, and then murdered him. Wonder if it was the person that he was cheating on Addie with. It doesn't seem like a jealous girl. It seems to me, it feels more like a man. I don't know. Part of it, in a way, seems like it could be. Just because covering all the tracks, trying to end it so nicely, seems like something that a woman would do. Trying to make everything so perfect and tied up in a nice little bow. Yeah, but if it was her, you would think that she would just kill Addy and then just frame him. It would want him to spend his life in prison. Yes Not and no. There is someone out there that are crazy and that are like, if I can't have him all by myself, nobody can. Yeah, I get that, but it just, to me, because it seems like a woman would want him to suffer, but a man would want him to, would want him dead because he'd be afraid that he would, obviously he would tell the police and maybe the police would believe him. Yeah, but why would they just leave him for so many days alive? Maybe know? to try to get credibility, make, the, make it seem more plausible. I don't know. That's what gets me is like, as weird as it is, the timeline does fit for him to do it. But it just, it seems too, like I said, it seems too final, too perfect. 
the fact that he did a full confession, which is rare, honestly. And then even if he did do it and commit suicide, would he really want to do a full confession for his family and his kids to hear about in the future? Obviously, he would have been suspect number one anyways. To me, it almost seemed like it's a third party killed her, maybe held him hostage, and then killed him afterwards to tie up any loose end. All right, there's just such a weird, mysterious element to this one that even though technically people believe that it's solved, it just feels so mysterious to me. It's just weird. Yeah, it really is. Technically, it's solved, but it just doesn't... Doesn't feel feel right. Yeah. This one is one that never felt right to me. I don't know how to explain it. There feels like there's more to the story. It feels like when I'm writing the story, when you're actually writing, you can do it that you can make the story too perfect. Yes, and it's weirdly predictable, and Mm -hmm. it's just not good. Yeah, and that's what this is. You got this weirdness element to it, and then all of a sudden it just falls into this perfect little box. It just doesn't make sense to me. And maybe I'm just overthinking it. Maybe this is exactly what happened, but it just doesn't feel right. It definitely feels weird. And who knows? New Orleans has a lot of serial killers and has had a lot in the past. Maybe there was another one. Or maybe there was someone that they pissed off and... Yeah. I don't know. Just a weird case. I keep saying mysteriousness to it because there is like this air of something isn't 100% right because everything is just fell into place so nice and perfectly and it just doesn't seem enough. Seems, it really does seem like a bad writer where it's just everything is predictable and just falls this series of events that just are too almost predictable and just end perfectly. I get it. I've been very slowly working on a murder mystery novel, and it's very difficult to write that way. And the best way that I have figured out how to write it is to work backwards on it. And then, obviously, I have to know the events backwards and write it from the beginning for the most part. But even that is really difficult. And even then, I'm finding there's little bits that are still really predictable. It's hard. But at the same time, it still just seems so predictable. I don't know. There's something about it. And see, I'm, I'm the complete opposite when I write it. I essentially give my characters life and let them at their way. Like, I, when I'm, like, I know how my story is going to go, but I'm always surprised at the end how it ends. Yeah, my poor characters have no choices of their own <laughs> that they make. They do not get choices. They do what I say that they're doing, <laughs> and that's... Yes. Yeah. See, my story is always, and it's it's like the weirdest feeling in life. It's so hard to explain to people, because I've talked to people about this before, even other writers, like not everyone does it, but essentially like I'll have a very vague outline of how, what, how, what events I want to happen and when. And even though those don't always happen when I expect them to. It is what it is. Everybody's process is different. Yeah. Oh, Yeah. But this seems, this almost seems like what you said, where a new writer who doesn't really know what they're doing made a detailed outline of what the events and then just boom. There's no character growth. There's no anything like that. You have Addie, who's got some anger issues and bipolar. And then you've got Zach, who's got PTSD. And you put them together, murder, suicide, boom. And then it's just, that's a nice little bow. It seems so weirdly simple that it's just not... And then that's the other thing is that this is, it's so accelerated. Yeah. That's the other thing is you get, you know, I remember seeing, reading interviews and stuff with his family and stuff. And everyone is shocked that he could do this. Oh, yeah. But, Nobody ever thought that he would be capable of anything along these lines. Which, granted, they're family, so they're going to be blinded a little bit. But it's just how it went from, because a lot of people describe their relationship at the beginning as perfect. Because they just got along so good. good. And then you go from that to go into murder and suicide. And it's just, and I get you got, you add that added element of cheating, supposedly. To me, that feels almost like a red herring. Yeah. It feels like somebody just added that in for fun. That's the other thing. As far as I've read, which obviously I could have missed something, but he was never described as someone who would cheat. See, and that's what I've heard too is that he's really not a cheater. So I don't know what Addie found. I don't know if she thought he was cheating, found something, and then decided in just a panic to go to the landlord and say, I just want it in my name only, mine. And that's that's one hill that I will die on. 
it's once a cheater, always a cheater. But you don't just go your whole life without being a cheater and then all of a sudden just become a cheater. I don't know. It's a weird deal. Yeah. It's just really weird. It just it, it doesn't make sense. Unless there's just something that we're missing. Obviously, we're not going to hear everything. And people are, tend to just release the good stuff. It's true. But I don't know. It just feels off to me. That's all. Many people believe voodoo had a part in this tragedy because it was only days after they moved in above the voodoo shop that the murder-suicide occurred. The building it occurred in is now part of the ghost tour of New Orleans, and it's said to be very haunted. Or was it haunted before? Was this place the final straw that caused the murder-suicide? Okay, so full disclosure again, because I like telling everybody everything. When Jordan told me she was going to do the story, I was actually going to try to do a similar story about voodoo. <clears throat> Couldn't actually do it, but I did a lot of research into it. And that's one thing, like, there's a lot of misconceptions about voodoo. I, I was guilty of it, too. I was always taught voodoo was just having a voodoo doll and about curses. There's a lot of misconceptions. It's not a bad thing. A lot of it's more for protection. Yeah, that's pretty much all it is, really. Now, of course, you've always got the people who want to make it dark and evil. But voodoo in itself, especially actual voodoo and then the New Orleans style voodoo, that's more about love and peace and all that stuff. It's not dark in any way. And I get it. I've seen multiple news stories and stuff about voodoo and documentaries about voodoo. And it's crazy how it gets this negative connotation about it. Well, and I get the same thing about any time that there's any symbols anywhere. It's witches or Satanists or voodoo or something. Any sort of anything is automatically taken to be horribly dark and terrible. When most of the time it's not. A lot of this is based on misunderstanding and your perception of it. So you get a negative perception or even a lot of times you just make your own perception based on how it sounds. A lot of people just don't understand it and they get scared of stuff that they don't understand. Well, and the media coverage of anything along those lines does not help at all whatsoever because it's always incorrect, it's not good, and it just is usually negative. Yeah, and I mean, I get it that they got to sell paper or, you know, sell, get advertising, blah, blah, blah. They got to sell bad news, basically. Making something seem worse than what it actually is. The media, that's what it's going to do because bad news sells. Sells. Plain and simple. We're all guilty of it. Oh, yeah. All the Baptists out there clutching their pearls. Yeah. So it's human nature. And that's why I get I get a kick out of it when everyone's like, oh, the media's bad. No, the media's telling you exactly what you want. And if it's not what you wanted, you won't be listening to it. Do your own research. Find out the true nature of most of these things and you'll understand where it really comes from because it's not that way at all. And I truly don't believe that voodoo had a part of any of this aside from the fact that it was in the same building. Quite literally, that's the only connection. That's just coincidence. But honestly, the paranormal is more likely to be involved than voodoo. That was what I was thinking too. I was thinking there's probably more of a paranormal connection than there is anything to do with voodoo don't honestly think that there's much else going on aside from it. Basically, that whole random mind was just, if you don't understand anything, that's fine. Just learn about it. Don't make snap judgments. Don't listen to what other people say. And don't be afraid to change your opinions on stuff. We all got to do it. We all got to grow. We all got to change. And it's perfectly fine. So do your research. Don't be dumb. <laughs>